special show today to launch my special studio. Got one of America's leading thinkers on technology, professor at Stanford, Fred Turner, old friend of mine. And Fred's an expert on hippies. <laughs> Fred, welcome to TechCrunch TV. Thanks, very nice to be here. So Fred, what have hippies got to do with the internet? Well, you know, hippies help legitimate the internet. Um, the counterculture that bubbled up in the 1960s embraced a set of ideas that were actually developed in the computer-centered research worlds of the 40s and 50s, and they made them seem really cool. Fred, Peter Thiel has blamed the internet on the hippies, so are you a conservative? Are you saying that the hippies have ruined the internet? On the contrary, what I'm saying is that the kind of self-centered, individually focused, um, business-oriented ways of making change that the hippies brought to life and celebrated um, have made it difficult for us to use the internet for some of the political purposes we might otherwise want to be using it for. Fred, you've got a new book out now, The Democratic Surround, but your mm -hmm. first book, which was very influential, From Counterculture to Cyberspace, laid out a narrative in the 60s about how the hippies embrace the internet. It mm -hmm. features mm -hmm. Stuart Brand and uh, a number of other leading figures in the foundation of digital society. What happened in the 60s that was so important in terms mm -hmm. of today, in terms of the internet? In the 1960s, um, the counterculture really broke into two groups. One was the new left, Students for a Democratic Society. They wanted to do politics to, 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 to change politics in American society. The other group, the new communalists, featured figures like Stuart Brand. They went back to the land had the largest movement of communal activity in all of American history to date, more than a million people living on communes. That group believed that if we could only organize our society around a shared mindset, a shared consciousness, we would be free, finally, from politics and able to build a new world. At the center of that hope for new consciousness was a celebration of new small-scale technologies, LSD, automobiles, and very shortly, the computer. Speaking of LSD, perhaps automobiles, and certainly the computer. Steve Jobs is, of course, the central figure in that. How does he play in the narrative? What's the role in Steve jo of Steve Jobs in, if you like, legitimizing hippie culture and values? Well, I think that's exactly Steve's role, is, is legitimizing it. You know, he lived on a commune for a year. He was a religious reader of the Whole Earth Catalog, Stuart Brand's publication. But outside of that, he was a quintessential lifestyle capitalist. He focused on trying to transform our lives with small-scale technologies, but in the process did it in such a way that was very much in keeping with the most rapacious ideals of American capitalism. When one thinks of the internet, and particularly in the way it's presented by its supporters, guys like Tim O'Reilly and Larry right. Lessig, it's presented as this thing without a center, all edge. Right. Is that a hippie value? I think it's a hippie fantasy. I'm not sure it's a hippie value. What's a hip that sounds very gross. <laughs> do, do hippies have fantasies, Fred? Well, they certainly used to. Uh, you know, go back to the 1960s, you go back to the communes. They dreamed of living on the edge, of literally living outside society. But when they did that, they tended to drop their communes in the middle of racial minorities, impoverished others, and tended to ignore those folks. That habit, that habit of building networks centered around shared beliefs and quietly, effectively excluding others haunts the internet today. So they're kind of fat, selfish, greedy capitalist pigs in disguise? Um, no. They were, um, they, they were um, adventurous middle class and upper middle class kids who wanted to change the world using the technologies and the ideals they found around them. And that's where the new book goes. The new book goes to thinking about the, liberal, the liberalism of the 40s and 50s as a precursor to what we got. The 60s impact on our world today isn't understandable if you don't understand first that the 60s are not a rebellion against the generation before them, but rather deeply in keeping with the liberal values of the 40s and 50s that brought us the consumer culture that so infuses the internet today. Fred, there's been a lot of experiments these days in terms of company organization, this idea of mm. flatness. Ev mm. Williams develops it at, at Medium, Tony mm -hmm. Say at Zappos. Is that an old hippie ideal of having flat organizations? Absolutely. It's a hippie ideal and it's a liberal ideal. The great fear in post-World Amer post War II American life is that bureaucracy at some level will become fascism. We're going to turn away from bureaucracy. We're going to build collaborative, leveled groups, first in research centers in the 40s and 50s, later in the counterculture and the communes of the 1960s, and now in computing. The fantasy is that somehow by doing that, we will escape 
rules, top-down governance, and all the problems that come with it. What we ignore is that in that space, we enter a new kind of managerial system of control um, that shapes our lives every bit as powerfully as the old bureaucratic top-down model did, but in ways that are much harder to challenge. How does Google play in this narrative? Well, Google's such a, a mixed bag. On the one hand, it's absolutely astonishing as a service to find information from around the world. On the other, it's a quintessential um, kind of capture space. It's a quintessential democratic surround, a space where we get surrounded by media options that are selected for us, constrained for us. We choose them, and as we do, we feel individually free. And yet, precisely as we feel individually free, we're entering a system that's been built to manage us. And so that combination of pursuing individual freedom and entering into a highly managed world, that's Google all over the place. So a, a kind of a, a repressed authoritarianism. Yeah, a very subtle authoritarianism. And it's, an author it's a deniable authoritarianism. It's got plausible deniability. An anti-authoritarian authoritarianism. There, that's it. An anti-authoritarian authoritarianism. That's the subject of your next book. Your first book, of course, From Counterculture to Cyberspace, dealt with the 60s. But now you've got a new book, The Democratic Surround, which, interestingly enough, goes back. Mm -hmm. goes back to the 30s and the 40s and the mm -hmm. 50s. Why did you go back with your new book? Well, I went back partly because I was so surprised in the other book, in the counterculture book, to see how much the people of the 1960s owed in terms of their ideas and their ideals to people in the 40s and so 50s. So these are people like Kevin Kelly. Kevin Kelly, Stuart Brand, Howard Rheingold, um, other student leaders, Abby Hoffman. They were reading people like Eric Fromm, the anthropologist Margaret Mead, Ruth Benedict. And when I started reading the older folks, I discovered that they were much wilder than we ever knew. You know, Margaret Mead and Ruth Benedict were anti-racist, pro-sexual liberation activists, very, very powerful liberating figures with a strong political agenda that set the stage for the counterculture, but whose politics in many ways the counterculture sort of took away. So why should, uh, why should TechCrunch people care about what Stuart Brand uh, and Kevin Kelly read? They should care about it because it's the foundation of the world they inhabit. The turn away from bureaucracy and away from fascism that took place in the 40s gave rise to the fantasy that through multimedia, through media environments, through information systems, we could manage ourselves into a new, more democratic reality. That fantasy gave rise to the highly managed, individual-centered capitalism that we're all working in today. I get the sense, reading your work and talking to you, Fred, that there's a layer of regret in your writing. Hmm. You, you, you speak and you write in a way that says, the internet could have been so wonderful, yeah. but it went so seriously wrong. Is that fair? It is fair. And you know, I was drawn to the counterculture, to studying the counterculture, precisely because I grew up in the wake of the 60s. And I thought, wow, maybe that really was a utopian possibility. Imagine my surprise when I went into studying the 60s and discovered that communes were, in fact, often quite racist, very heteronormative, very conservative places. I felt you, were a in a, you were in a commune? Uh, no, I've studied communes. No. <laughs> That's, thanks for checking. Um, if you had been, I wouldn't have invited you on the show. Right, I appreciate that. I wouldn't be wearing this. Um, but what I have seen is, is a sort of similar turn in places like Google. You know, I, I, I want Google very much to be a wide open public information place, a place that serves everyone. And instead, I, I do see emerging in Google and in Facebook places where the pursuit of individual freedom and sociability, the very things that make everyday life work, are also integrating us into commercial systems that manage us very carefully and closely. And that's an enormously frustrating. I, 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 have, I share a vision with Margaret Mead of an America that is diverse racially, sexually, socially, tolerant, politically alert. That's not the world that's coming into being on Facebook and Google. So Fred, this is TechCrunch. We have to be cheerful, <laughs> even if it doesn't come naturally to us. Uh -huh. uh, to finish, give me an example of one internet company or technology mm -hmm. that gives us reason to be cheerful, that actually mm -hmm. could draw us back to the idealism of the 30s or mm -hmm. even the 60s. And secondly, a thinker, a writer, an entrepreneur who you think does understand where this revolution can go. So on the, on the, on the web system, I'd go with Global Voices Online. I think you know, Rebecca McKinnon and Ethan Zuckerberg have done a tremendous job giving voice to the voiceless, really, truly helping us um, reach out to and understand the points of view of others very much unlike ourselves. Is that a, a non-profit? I believe it is a non-profit. I don't know for sure, but I do, be, I do believe it's a non-profit. Ca yeah. Can you do good and be profitable online? I don't know. I don't know. I think you can. I don't think profit is the evil. I, yeah, I, I think you can, actually. I think Kiva might be an example. 
Um, I don't, I'm not sure. They may be a nonprofit also. Can you, can you pursue profit? Good is such a mixed bag. You know, I look at Google. Part of that is very good. Part of the information that they provide is spectacular. It's the monitoring that's the problem. So yes, I do think you can, you can do that. I do. Well, let's say Larry Page is watching now. I hope he is. Uh, mm -hmm. He doesn't have much else to do. Um, in 15 seconds, what advice would you give him? Because he is a guy who could save this thing. He has the power right. and the intelligence and perhaps even the conscience. Supply not just information, but mechanisms for people to gather and organize politically across the political, racial, and class divides that are rupturing our society. Well, there you have it, Larry Page, if you're watching. Fred Turner, real honor and pleasure, author of a new book, The Democratic Surround, the most important voice when it comes to culturally critiquing what really happens on the internet. Fred Turner, real honor to have you on TechCrunch Great. TV. Thank you so much, Andrew. Really nice to be here.